Hi, my name is Tanya and it is such a pleasure to have you here today to speak at this symposium about the Boston Capro, its role in the treatment of end-stage corneal disease and when you might consider referring your patient for a Capro. Joined with me today, we have a very special guest, Maria, who has herself gotten a Capro in the last few years and she's kindly agreed to come on stage to speak about her experience from the patient perspective. So Maria, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about yourself to start with. Hi, my name is Maria. I'm a little bit nervous. Um, thank you so much for having me on board. It's just a real honor to speak to the medical community about my experience with the K-Pro. Uh, to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm 36. I have two children, beautiful children. I have an amazing husband. I had the K-Pro put into my eye uh, about four years ago now. And for me, it, it was really worthwhile. Definitely not without its struggles, but definitely for me, it was, uh, I would do it again. Maria, it is so lovely to hear that you had a positive experience with this because it really was a journey, wasn't it? And I was wondering if you could perhaps put this into context for the audience today about what it was that made you lose your vision and the steps that led up to you being referred to our services. Sure, so I was 24 when the accident happened. There was an explosion at work and a combination of the trauma, the blunt force, and the shattered glass just completely destroyed the front of my eyes. It's just to the fact that I needed multiple surgeries to fix them, and in the end I was left unable to see. When I lost my vision, it was devastating. I lost my job, my you know, we lost our house because the medical expenses were so much. I was really struggling to look after myself, and then there were the kids and the house and, and my husband. It was all really getting a bit much. I think in total I had four transplants in the right and five to the left, but over time they just kept rejecting and, and failing, and then I got the high pressure in the eyes, and I had to have the drops, and then they gave me some laser, and, and then I needed, like, surgeries for that too and at the end they told me that you have these things called stem cells in the front of your eyes and mine weren't working anymore and I wasn't a candidate for any more corneal transplants so that was a pretty dark period in the, my life literally. Maria I know it wasn't easy to revisit a lot of that history so thanks for sharing that with our audience today. Maria's outlined the classic patient that might seek our services for the K-Pro. The classic patient is a patient with multiple failed corneal transplants, often with concurrent glaucoma care and surgeries, and often with limbal stem cell failure. And it's really important that we know that these patients come to us because they should have and have exhausted all other forms of visual rehabilitation treatment. Not only that, but these are reserved to patients with bilateral corneal end-stage blindness, not monocular. So if they had a good eye and a bad eye, I wouldn't operate. If they had a good eye that could donate some limbal stem cell tissue, transfer that to the other eye, repopulate that surface and support another corneal transplant, then that's the option we would take in preference to a K-Pro. But what even is a K-Pro? Because many of you in the audience will either have never seen one or probably will never see one in your careers. So I've put up a picture of the K-Pro for you to have a look at. This is a type 1. There are two types of Boston K-Pros, type 1 and type 2. Maria has a type 1, and it's actually the only one available in Canada and the one that we're going to focus our discussion on today. The K-Pro consists of three main parts. There's the front solid PMMA plate, a donor carrier graft, and then a back 8.5 millimeter titanium porous plate. And they're clipped together with an interlocking mechanism and then sewn into the surface of the eye. Sometimes we get lucky and we get 20-40 vision. But most of the time, what we're hoping for is functional navigational vision. This is not about the numbers. This is about quality of life. 
So Maria, I was wondering if you could perhaps tell us um, what it was when you first heard about this technology. Sure, so for me, it was hope. It was literally light at the end of the tunnel. My local corneal specialist had said to me after a period of time, look, Maria, there, there is a small but not insignificant chance that we might be able to resurrect some vision in your eyes. And I was elated. You can't understand how much of a difference it made even just hearing those words. But he also told me that I had to be realistic and that from what I understand, not everyone's a candidate for the KPRO and even in those that are, it doesn't always work. So if anything, I came to that first visit with you really unprepared but sort of psychologically thinking that I probably wouldn't be a candidate anyway as so much had happened to my eyes. And I remember that first meeting really well, Maria. When you came to our clinic, absolutely, as you've mentioned, we had to determine whether you or not you were a good candidate for the KPRO. And when we examined Maria's eyes, we found that she had a moist ocular surface, yes, with the failed corneal transplants, but they were quiet. She also had relatively intact posterior segment, eyelids, and fornices, essential characteristics, particularly with the lid and fornices, to maintain a contact lens. These are crucial elements for the patient to even retain the device in their eye, let alone think about vision. In these patients, it's really important, before we even go down the risk of surgery, to get them to understand, so you as the clinician and also the patient, need to understand that these are complex eyes with difficult pathology. And this journey should only be undertaken with the full understanding of both and that you're both adequately resourced and prepared to take that journey together. So Maria, perhaps this is a good time to talk about uh, what we spoke about in that first visit, if you can remember, about this impact it would have and the limitations it would have on your life. Sure, so I remember you telling me that the vision wasn't gonna be perfect and that it might not always work. I remember you telling me that we would know each other really, really well. Um, I also remember you telling me that my glaucoma could get worse, the skin on the front of my eyes could break down, I could get recurrent infections. And I remember you telling me that at any point the device might be able, might you know, start to come out of my eye and need to be removed. But most of all, I remember you telling me that this wasn't going to last forever and that we were on borrowed time. And from that point, I completely changed my attitude because if this was going to work and we were going to have a chance at some vision, I was going to use every opportunity I got to spend that time with my loved ones and my friends and my family. Maria's operation occurred that day. Uh, the day that Maria's operation occurred, we actually had the assistance of our glaucoma colleagues and if I could just highlight that often these operations, if they're not done just with the corneal team, we often call upon the expertise of our vitro-retinal colleagues, our glaucoma colleagues, and it's a really multidisciplinary approach in a tertiary center from that point onwards, not only at the time of surgery, but also afterwards. And as Maria's highlighted, the follow-up is really intense. So these patients are seen after their operation at day one, week one, week two monthly for the first six months, and then every three or four months thereafter for the life of the device. So that's really intense. And from the perspective of the patient, they wear a lifelong contact lens and they're on lifelong topical antibiotics. This is to reduce keratitis, reduce rates of endophthalmitis, and also improve cosmesis and also refrate, uh, aid refractive error. From a complications perspective, certainly glaucoma is tricky because we don't have any ocular surface that's amenable to taking an accurate pressure, so we rely on digital palpation or an OCT if we can get it. Membranes behind the contact lens, sorry, behind the KPRO are often really dense, and then we get lasered, and then they get lasered, and then they get lasered because they're really aggressive and recurrent. And finally, as you've heard, there can be fitting around the edges of the device, and the device can extrude and need to be removed. So Maria, I was wondering if you could perhaps tell us about what your quality of vision was like and also about the day that things started to go downhill from there. Sure, so 
I've heard of people getting five years out of these devices. I had two wonderful years, and for that I am so grateful. I was able to see my youngest grow up from the ages of two to four, and you know that, that they grow so quickly during that stage. I was able to see the faces of my husband and my loved ones, and it's a both a blessing and a curse that it's a possibility that they may be the last visual memories of them I'll ever have. The day that my vision started to go, I remember well. It was associated, I had a lot of pain, it wasn't getting better, and I rang up and made an appointment. And I came in and you sat me down after taking a look at my eye and told me that it was time to take the device out because we were losing that battle. It was, I think, extrude was the word that you said. And now I have another corneal transplant in my eye. It was designed to fail, so I'm back to seeing shadows again. But at least I got to keep my eye, and there's a part of me that holds out onto that hope that there might be something in the future that can help me see again. So I guess if you were to ask me if I would do it again, as I said at the beginning, it was worth it for me. I know it's not for everyone, but it was definitely worth it. Maria, thank you so much for coming along today and, and sharing your experiences because we really don't really get to explore what it's like to be on the other side, particularly with a device like this and in a situation like yours. And I hope for the audience today that we've demonstrated that this is a good but imperfect option for patients that are at the end stage of bilateral corneal blindness. It doesn't always work in everyone, but for those patients in which it does, it makes a world of difference. So for today, I ask you, consider a referral for a KPRO assessment in your bilaterally blind corneal patient. Select the right patient carefully, counsel intensively, and make sure that you're there to support your patient all the way through.